Hello everybody, my name is Professor Scott Keyes uh, and I will be your instructor for this course. Um, just to begin, um, the PowerPoints that you're looking at here are intended to be your lectures. For, In other words, if you were to have taken this course uh, in a traditional sense where we would have met face to face, uh, this is the content that I would have provided for you uh, in a in a face-to-face -face based lecture uh, and uh, I want to ensure that you have a very similar experience uh, online as you would have otherwise so every single one of these PowerPoints will be voice narrated by me uh, and I'm going to be doing more than simply just reading what's on the on the PowerPoint slide there I'll be reading out of uh, a textbook from time to time and I will be elaborating uh, on various topics uh, so that we are very clear, the textbook that I'm going to be reading out of, it's called America, A Narrative History. I'm reading from the sixth edition, and the authors of that particular text are George Brown Tyndall and David E. Shy. in case you are interested. It is a two-volume based uh, history of the United States, and it is really, really well done. That stated, uh, a lot of American history courses begin, of course, with 1607 and the establishment of the Jamestown Colony, but I like to go back a little bit earlier than that, in fact, a good deal earlier than that, and, and look at the American continent prior to European settlement. Uh, the misnomer that oftentimes happens is that, well, this was a land that was open for Europeans to take. There was no significant cultures here, and uh, that's simply not true. And so what I want to spend this, this first uh, lecture doing is looking at early American settlement and then we will end with European colonization and you can see it starts with prehistory till about 1590 that little C that you see there that's called a circa circa means approximately or about means I don't exactly know specifically which date something happened or I'm approximating a time period uh, so that's stated we're gonna be looking at the Aztecs today we're gonna be looking at the Maya we're gonna be looking at the Olmec uh, and then a number of North American civilizations as well. Uh, but we're going to get into that here in a second. Um, I'm going to be reading to you real quick uh, from page 7 of that uh, America, a narrative history. A and this is what it says. It says, The first humans in North America discovered an immense continent with extraordinary climactic and environmental diversity. Coastal plains, broad grasslands, harsh deserts, and soaring mountain ranges all required different modes of living that in turn generated distinct social structures and cultural patterns. By the time Columbus discovered the quote-unquote New World, the native peoples of North America had developed a diverse array of communities that used almost 400 different languages. Yet despite the distances and dialects separating these different Indian societies, the so-called Paleo-Indians created extensive trading networks that helped diffuse ideas and innovations. Contrary to the romantic myth of early Indian civilizations living in perfect harmony with nature and one another, the native societies exerted great pressure on their environments and engaged in frequent warfare uh, with one another. Now, what we're going to be looking at here is uh, a group of people that live in what we call Mesoamerica, and we're going to be looking at them first, and, and that would have been the Olmec, the Maya, and the Aztec, and they were more in uh, what we would now look at central Mexico and Honduras. And then we'll be looking at a number of uh, North American civilizations. Now, uh, from the outset, it's important to note that the Mesoamerican civilizations were by far more advanced uh, socially, politically, religiously, uh, agriculturally uh, than the North American tribes, uh, which you typically would associate with U.S. history. Uh, and we're going to be showing how and why that was the case. But let's go ahead and just dive right into this. Alright, early American migration and settlement. It says prior to European settlement, and of course when we're talking about Europeans, we're predominantly speaking uh, about the Dutch, the French, the English, and the Spanish. Uh, and those are the main four that, that really uh, people of American history concern themselves with, although there were others. But prior to European settlement, the northern and southern American continents were home to more than 2,000 separate cultures and people groups. And we're looking at the Aztecs, the Mayas, the Olmec. You also have the Inca, uh, and they're located more in South America, uh, in Peru. And then in North America, you have a number of different groups, uh, and uh, some of those include the Adena and the Hopwell, the Mississippian, and the Anazazi, and they're all 
in North America. And as it says, several hundred different languages were spoken. The book said about 400 different languages were spoken by these groups of people. And each had their own religious practices and, and, and uh, political institutions. And uh, they were on different uh, ranges within the uh, scale of civilization. But they all left lasting impressions that need to be, rec that need to be reconciled. It says, historians estimate that the first inhabitants of the Americas began migrating from Asia uh, between 15,000 to 30,000 years ago. Um, these individuals came out of Siberia, and they crossed a land bridge that today no longer exists. Today, uh, the land bridge has been covered with water uh, because around 10,000 B.C., the last ice age ended and all the ice caps melted and covered up the land bridge that was there. So today we have the Bering Sea, or Berina, and when they crossed, however, there was land there, and they crossed something known as the Bering Strait. Okay. You can see here uh, in our picture uh, on the left-hand side, uh, the light brown portion would have been land. Uh, 15 to 30,000 years ago and that's why people from Siberia could cross over into Alaska and then migrate south through Canada, modern day Canada, and then into the modern United States. Today on the right hand side you see what it looks like today. There, the, All that land would have been gone. Instead you had the Bering Sea. So just be aware that that's where historians assume or estimate where the first Americans, if you want to call them that, came from. It says these early people were hunter-gatherers and it is speculated that large animal migrations prompted many of these early migrants to cross uh, the land bridge. Um, because they're not agriculturally based people, and you're not going to see them become agri agriculturally based for many, many years, uh, they had to go where the food went. So if, you know, if the woolly mammoth or the bison or the mastodon went and crossed the Bering Strait, uh, then you went with them. Uh, and so uh, the first Americans didn't populate the geography of, of what would be called the New World uh, because they were trying to find a you know religious free freedom of religious persecution or they were trying to institute new civilizations. No, nope, they went there because they simply followed where the food went. Okay, If your Big Mac got up and walked away, you'd follow it, and that's what happened here. Uh, so they migrated for basic survival purposes. Now, as time goes on um, and the Ice Age ends, Climactic change is going to force many of these hunter-gatherers to become less nomadic uh, and force them to settle and develop forms of agriculture, and we'll see how that works out here in a second. It says, these early migrants reached the Yukon River around 27,000 years ago, give or take, and historians guess that as the last ice age ended, which took place around 10,000 BC, roadways were created to the south of modern-day Canada, which provided travel ways for these people. And so it is estimated that the first inhabitants of what we now call uh, the North American uh, continent, that they first inhabited that region approximately 12,500 B.C. Now that, of course, is based upon archaeology and carbon dating uh, and historiographical work. Um, so that's all. Uh, there's no hard and fast date for exactly when the very first peoples came because they didn't leave any records for us. And, and that's probably a good note to make. Uh, just so you're aware, history doesn't become history until someone writes it down. Uh, if it's not written down, we have no record of it and we have no way of knowing that it happened. Uh, and so uh, that's where archaeology, anthropology, and, uh, and the like are very helpful uh, to historians. So it's exactly where the first migrants settled is, is not really known for sure. Uh, definitely carbon dating has been beneficial in this respect to try to help us understand where uh, and when the first migrants settled down. And, and when we say settled, we mean that they became less nomadic. They became more agricultural. Uh, they began to establish settlements, more permanent settlements than just your typical hut that you will uh, uh, pick up and, and take with you. But there's a couple of places that historians have isolated uh, as being the very first locations uh, where a settlement took place. And one is in uh, North America. It's actually in Clavis, New Mexico. And the other is Monte Verde, southern Chile is where it's located. Now, uh, it, is, it, it is speculated that Monte Verde is the very first location in which humans made permanent settlements in the Americas. 
and that's up for debate. What's not up for debate is that Mont uh, Clovis, New Mexico, was, in fact, the very first permanent settlement for people in North America. So, let me, so, so to say this another way, some will argue that Clovis may be the site for permanent settlement in all of the Americas, and that's up for debate. But what is not up for debate is that Clovis was the very first permanent settlement in North America, and that's located in New Mexico. And, and so let's take a look at these real quick. It says at Mount Verde, uh, archaeologists have unearthed a number of artifacts which lead them to believe that settlement took place there approximately 12,500 B.C. as opposed to 9,500 B.C. for the Clovis site. So, you know, there's about 3,000 or so years that separates uh, these two uh, settlement sites. And again, that's all done on carbon dating. Uh, that's fairly exact, but it's not a totally exact science. So that's why there's still debate as to uh, is, in fact, uh, this site at Mount Verde, is that really the very first site? Now, some of the artifacts that they have found at Mount Verde are they have found uh, pieces of mastodon meat, uh, uh, sort of petrified frozen meat, uh, which indicated that there was something that existed there. They have found tools, crude, very crude stone tools, uh, rock paintings, house buildings, uh, that type of thing. So there is evidence uh, in Mount Verde that settlement existed there uh, dating back to approximately 12,500 B.C. Uh, and that's why they typically say that that's the earliest settlement. It says Clovis is the earliest known settlement in North America, as I've already mentioned to you. Uh, and some, again, might argue maybe it's the earliest in all of America. Uh, but, and archaeologists have unearthed many crude stone and bone, what we might call choppers or scrapers. Again, we're dealing with sort of primitive civilizations here. They're evolving, if you will. Uh, becoming less primitive into more advanced. And those uh, stone tools definitely help to indicate that advancement. It says around 11,000 B.C. or so, it is believed that those who eventually settled at the Clovis site began to improve upon their tools and spear shafts, indicating a more advanced people group. It says they were a group of, quote, mobile communities, which eventually fragmented due to climate change, largely due to the end of the Ice Age. The, the end of the Ice Age had massive ecological uh, consequences, uh, not only upon the animal life uh, in the region, but of course upon the people themselves. It's why you really do see uh, nomadic groups of people become more centralized and civilized, uh, if you will, if you want to use that term, uh, and more settled, because the types of animals that they were eating began to die off guess a little bit of survival of the fittest here um, and so because what you were used to eating began to die off you had to come up with with more permanent ways of, of ensuring food and that of course means farming and farming means you have to settle you can't farm leave and then come back uh, it wouldn't be there so that's significant to understand now some of these tools uh, are as you can see here these arrowheads these spearheads they uh, tended to be more advanced uh, than uh, some of the previous uh, types of artifacts that were found in the Clovis site. Now, they use these for a variety of different reasons. Uh, obviously, hunting is going to be one of them. Uh, they had this very unique sling, uh, and they were very deadly accurate with using uh, these arrowheads, these point heads, and this sling to kill very large animals. Uh, you can imagine that must have been rather intimidating. Uh, but, of course, they're also used uh, as tools as well to do whatever work it is that they were doing. Uh, and, and again, these are indicative of a more advanced, evolved group of people who live along the Clovis site. So uh, I just wanted to show those to you so you kind of had an idea of what we were looking at and talking about. It says, one of the greatest results of climate change, as I had mentioned to you, remember 10,000 B.C. and the last Ice Age, uh, was the way in which these early inhabitants hunted. Animals used to colder climates became extinct and early hunters had to rely on the bison for their food and materials. And you're going to see that the buffalo, in fact, in North America, is going to become uh, the animal of choice. It says new weapons also had to be devised, which could be thrown with accuracy and speed. And this included some of the fulsome points, which I believe there was a couple of those on the preceding page uh, that I showed you. I, I can't actually remember whether or not those were fulsome points. 
um, or, or other types. But the Folsom Point, located and named Folsom because they were located in Folsom, New Mexico, uh, indicates uh, an even more advanced group of people. Again, the end of the Ice Age radically changed everything. People had to adapt or they would die. Uh, to the changing climactic and ecological conditions of the time. Uh, and one of the ways that they did that was by becoming more technologically advanced. Now today we think of technology in the sense of computers and, 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 and the like, but uh, clearly more advanced tools uh, is a form of technology. Now, that's kind of how the Americas were settled. Okay, uh, Very brief, again I don't mean to spend a whole lot of time on any of this just because we're dealing with United States history but I think it's important to have this context uh, so that kind of gives you an idea of how people got here what they were doing and ultimately they evolved and they developed what I want to show you now is where some of these people developed at and specifically who some of these people were now some of these people as we will talk about settled in North America Others, however, settled in an area known as Mesoamerica, and so we refer to them as Mesoamerican civilizations. Now, these civilizations were by far the most advanced people in all of the Americas. Um, there's a lot of rich, deep cultural history and, and tradition in North American tribes, for sure, but as far as, you know... Ugh. As far as importance goes, politically, culturally, even architecturally, one really has to say that the Olmec, the Aztec, the Maya, and of course the Inca uh, had much more of an influence in that respect than, uh, say, did the Mississippian. Uh, and, and that's just a reality that's, that's there. But what is Mesoamerica? It says Mesoamerica is a geographic region which stretches from south-central Mexico to the northern reaches of modern-day Honduras. And the individuals who lived in that area are listed there. Now, you will not see the Inca. Inca are not Mesoamerican. They are South American. They are in uh, along the Andes Mountains in Peru. Okay. It says, unlike those who settled at Clavis, New Mexico, and Mount Verde, more is known about these particular people groups. And partially that's because they left written records. Okay. And like I said, history doesn't become history until you write it down. Now, Geographically speaking, you can see uh, the map here. This is Mesoamerica. Uh, and you can see, if you're familiar with the map, that you've got Mexico coming down here from the left down to out where it says the Olmec heartland. And then you start moving into areas like uh, Honduras, Guatemala, uh, Belize, th those types of regions. And you can see the various people groups and where they existed within this geographic spectrum. Uh, right there in the middle, you have the Olmec and as far as a timeline goes, they were the first to develop in the area. Following them were the Maya, who uh, established uh, a number of very significant and important civil civilizations and societies. Uh, one here at the top, uh, if you look at the far right, uh, Chichen Itza, and then Tikal, there uh, just south of that, uh, very significant. And then finally you've got the Aztec, uh, who um, developed in an area known as the Valley of Mexico and their most significant city was uh, Tenochtitlan uh, and you can see that there and Teotihuacan uh, that was also created. So I uh, just wanted to give you uh, a visual understanding of what we're talking about and so I'm going to begin with the Olmec and then move to the Maya and end with the Aztec and then, and then we'll go from there. But let's briefly go through this. So it's between 2000 to 1500 BC the area of Mesoamerica developed many permanent agricultural towns, which in turn helped to bring about agrarian societies growing a variety of crops. Uh, and some of these crops are as follows. You have tomatoes, you have beans, pumpkin, squash, and most importantly, you have maize, uh, which is a form of corn. In fact, maize was considered such a significant crop that they worshipped it as a god. It was a life-giving entity. Uh, it's a lot like looking at the ways in which the Egyptians worshipped the Nile. In fact, the Egyptians used to refer to the Nile as hapi. Hapi means well-fed or fat, uh, which indicates the, the importance of the Nile. The Nile brought various types of crops which fed the people and kept them fat and happy, if you want to call it that way. Uh, and so they worshipped the Nile as a god. This, in, in this way, the Mesoamericans also worshipped the corn, or, or this maize. They, 
uh, originally was uh, relegated for royalty, much like you would have seen the cocoa bean. Chocolate was sort of relegated for royalty, although that's become much more of a commoner's uh, food, uh, especially today. Um, but just, just be aware of that. It says, of all crops, maize was the most significant, and its origins can be traced back uh, to approximately 4,500 B.C. Now, of the earliest Mesoamerican civilizations, uh, it is the Olmec. And as you can see there, the Olmec uh, developed in Mesoamerica around 12,000 B.C. So let's talk briefly about them. It says, like other civilizations, such as the Zapotec, and, and I'm not going to spend any time looking at the Zapotec, uh, other than to say that this is another group of people who are living within that area. Uh, the Olmec developed permanent settlements where they built large earthworks, massive pyramids, plazas, and monuments. The Olmec had uh, courtyards. Uh, they established various types of games, played with balls. Um, they had religious practices. Uh, they had political institutions. And they had permanent settlements. Uh, you can see here listed in 1150 BC, uh, give or take, the permanent settlement of San Lorenzo was built. San Lorenzo it lasted until around 900 BC, when for whatever reason it was abandoned and destroyed. And once that took place, they built La Venta in 900 uh, BC. Now the Mesoamericans are very important, uh, especially the Olmec, uh, because of their influence upon other civilizations. We refer to the Olmec, for example, uh, and I may bring this up again, but re we refer to the Olmec as what we call a mother culture. Uh, it is a culture that influenced the development of other civilizations in the area, uh, and specifically the Maya, much more the Maya than the Aztec, but we'll get to that. Um, some of the things that you need for historians to classify you as being an advanced civilization is you're going to need um, a form of writing, a system of writing, which the Maya had. I'm sorry, the Olmec had. You're going to need permanent settlements, which they did have. Uh, you're going to have to have some type of skilled labor to, in order to build uh, various complexes and things, and we know that they had that skilled labor because there's, art, there's uh, evidence of it all scattered all over the area. And so the Olmec classify as an advanced civilization. But you also have to have uh, what we would look at as some type of religious institution. And the Olmec did have this. It says the Olmec also developed a unique religious practice based upon the worship of the jaguar. Uh, and uh, the jaguar was seen as kind of a natural element, uh, uh, various uses and, 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 and ways of worshiping the jaguar, uh, but they, they worshiped that. It says many historians disagree on exactly what the jaguar represented, but some theories guess that the jaguar was a powerful rain god, a god who would shed its blood down as rain and help grow crops. And so you would offer things, for example, like the maize, the corn, you would offer that up to the god, the jaguar god, because not only did the corn uh, keep the rain falling, which would grow the corn, the corn would obviously sustain you personally, uh, and that became extremely important. It says, other theories suggest that many jaguar gods existed, that they were polytheistic. Uh, poly meaning many gods, polytheistic, multiple gods. And they were represented as various natural elements, such as maize, the corn. Okay, so these are just some theories. Exactly uh, what that jaguar represented, it's difficult to know for sure. But nonetheless, uh, we know that that jaguar was important. It says, like the Chauvin civilization, again, we're not going to talk about them, but again, just to mention that there was other groups there, uh, which developed in modern-day Peru, the Olmec would leave behind a lasting legacy. They were, as I've aforementioned, a mother culture. Their architecture, their social structures, these things lasted beyond the Olmec. Even though the Olmec disappeared, their, uh, their relics, their pyramids, their plazas, their... Uh, their practices, they, they did remain, and the Maya specifically, much more so than the Aztec, uh, adopted these uh, cultural practices and continue to thrive in, and use them. It says, the development of religion, social classes, and complex organizations makes the Olmec one of the earliest advanced Mesoamerican civilizations. Now, I don't need to spend a whole lot more time on the Olmec. Again, none of this is... Uh, intended to be looked at in any major amount of depth, but 
I think it's important to understand, yeah, there are people here. There are civilizations thriving and existing long before Europeans ever showed up, long before the English came and settled Jamestown and Massachusetts Bay and Plymouth and uh, all these others. Um, so I just want to be very clear on that, that this is important to me, and that's why we're, we're covering that. Now, one last thing to say about the Olmecs. Uh, what you're looking at here is some of what they left behind. Uh, on the bottom right, you can see you kind of have this half jaguar, half man uh, statue. Uh, this is uh, an indication or a relic, if you will, of their form of worship. It's one of the things uh, that helps us to know that they had a religious practice based upon the jaguar. And the other thing that you're seeing here is a giant head. These heads were strewed all over. Uh, the area uh, when archaeologists found them. They're big, over six feet, and uh, weighing tons and tons of pounds, lots of weight. Uh, not totally 100% sure what they represent, although one uh, has theorized, and it seems to be the preceding theory, that these heads represent their kings. Uh, and so this indicates again that there is not just a religious institution, but a political institution. Uh, as well, but since you know there was no marker on here as to what in fact that represented, it we, you know it's all speculative at this point. Other things that you might have seen uh, were their villages, their pyramids. Uh, theirs are very similar to the Maya, or rather, we should say the Maya were s their their pyramids were similar to the Olmec, but that's what you're looking at here is is Olmec uh, Olmecian pyramids, step pyramids. Uh, so clearly they had some skill involved in what they were constructing uh, and these pyramids were probably used for religious purposes definitely they were used for religious reasons in the Mayan civilization we, one can uh, assume that that's probably also the case for the Olmec alright this is the Olmec disappeared around 400 BC but their legacy could be found in the cultural achievements of the Mayan civilization which by 250 BC was flourishing. Now, one of the things that's important to note is that there were Mayans in the area during the time that the Olmec were living. The height of the Mayan civilization took place during the during the 250 BC period. That's when what we call their, their golden period, the classical age of Mayan civilization began during 250 BC. Uh, prior to that you have the pre-classical age, then you have the classical age which begins in 250 BC, then you have the post-classical age, and then you have the period of Spanish conquest. Now there are Mayans still around today. Uh, you can go and see them. Uh, I know specifically in Belize because I lived with them for a while. And uh, so they're still there, but their empire, their civilization as a major empire, is not. It says, like the Olmec, the Mayan also built major cities such as Tikal, which was located in modern day northern Guatemala. Okay? Um, and what you're going to find is that word Guatemala is highlighted. There is a video there. Uh, if you click on that, you can watch this short video uh, on the Maya. And uh, I would encourage you uh, to do that. Okay. Uh, in fact, I would encourage you to do that now. I would click on it, watch it, then come back and finish the PowerPoint. All right, now that you've kind of seen what Tikal looks like based upon the video that you watched, let me briefly talk about it. It says, cities such as Tikal were home to giant pyramids. Again, as you saw, temples, palaces, and stone carvings, uh, most likely of their gods. Now, we do know that these pyramids were used for their religious worship for their gods, uh, and uh, they built them up. Uh, to appease their gods, and a lot of their pyramids were representative of the uh, underworld, which they called Shibalba. They uh, were of the opinion that all humanity was made from this underworld, and they also assumed that the majority of humanity, kings included, would return to the underworld. Only those dying what we would refer to as really horrific or violent deaths would, would then move onward to their, their afterlife. It says, the city of Tikal which, again, you saw, boasted a pyramid known now as Pyramid 4, which stretched some 212 feet into the air. Now, I, I mention this because it's uh, architectural achievement. It says, the pyramids of Tikal were the largest structures in, in the American hemispheres until 1903. 
1903 AD. I believe the Flatiron Building in New York eventually uh, grew taller than some of these pyramids that the Mayan had constructed. So this indicates a great um, knowledge of mathematics, engineering, uh, and uh, you know that the Maya possessed, and they built some fairly significant pieces. Again, you can see some of those here, and if you watched the film, you would have seen quite a few of these. They showed they showed a number of them, uh, but just be aware of what it is that these guys are are, are accomplishing uh, in their cities. It says the Maya also developed a unique religious practice focused upon the worship of many gods who inhabited the thirteen layers of the sky and the nine layers of the underworld. Again, those nine layers are referred to as Shibalba. Uh, they saw that there was gods of corn, death, rain, war, almost anything you can imagine. They, they had gods, so again, they are a polytheistic group of individuals. Uh, and it says, to please their gods, Mayans would frequently engage in human sacrifices. Uh, they would engage in bloodletting, prayers, food offerings, dances. Uh, of course, the Mayans are mostly remembered for their uh, horrific display of death in capturing various people and uh, killing them by human sacrifice. Uh, and the Mayans regularly engaged in human sacrifice, though not to the extent that the Aztec would. Uh, indeed, the Aztec were much more barbarous, if you want to use that term, um, with regards to human sacrifice than the Mayans were. But that doesn't mean that the Mayans didn't kill their fair share of human sacrifices to these gods. Uh, other portions of their religion, and, and I may have mentioned this again in the, in the lecture here, uh, is that they had established a, a, a concrete system of calendars. In fact, they had two different calendars. And um, if you're listening to this, then you'll know that the Maya were wrong. Uh, because they um, said that the world was going to come to an end in 2012. Uh, but they had a, a fairly uh, accurate system of calendars, which um, indicates, again, that they not only understood mathematics, but they understood astronomy as they tried to identify the various numbers of days uh, uh, in a year and identifying years themselves. Uh, so that's uh, that's a cultural achievement uh, and a mathematical one at well, as well. It says the Mayans also developed an advanced system of writing consisting of 800 glyphs. Uh, again, writing is significant. Uh, and for the Mayans, uh, they recorded their history. They recorded all different types of things. And they wrote them down in something known as a codex. And a codex would be a bark paper. They might carve it into stone. Uh, and these codexes still remain today. And it's one of the reasons why we are able to know who they were. Now. The Mayan civilization, or what we call the classical Mayan civilization, the height of the Mayan power, came to an end around 900 AD. Uh, it is not completely sure why the Mayan civilization came to an end, but as with everything else, historians and anthropologists and archaeologists, they all have their theories. Uh, some believe that internal and external warfare brought them down. Others believe that overpopulation and exploitation of natural resources tended to do it, and, and, and I'm of that opinion. While others believe that famine, disease, and drought uh, took them out. What we do know is that the Maya practiced a type of agricultural policy known as slash and burn, uh, which really saps the ground of its nutrients, and it doesn't allow for you to sustain any massive amount of population for long, long stretches of time. Uh, because, of course, the ground gets saps of its nutrients and it won't produce food for you. I believe that's ultimately what did them in. Going back to our textbook, it says, About AD 900, the complex Mayan culture collapsed. The cause of its collapse remains uncertain. Pollen recovered from underground debris suggests that the Mayans overexploited the rainforest upon whose fragile ecosystem they depended. Overpopulation also placed added strain on Mayan society. The primary factor, however, was unrelenting civil war among the Mayans themselves. Mayan war parties destroyed each other's cities and took prisoners who were then sacrificed to the gods in theoretical ritual. Whatever the reason for the weakening of the Mayan society, it succumbed to the Toltecs, a warlike people who conquered most of the region in the 10th century. But around A.D. 1200, the Toltecs too mysteriously disappeared. But nonetheless, 
the Mayan have left their their stamp on uh, history of the Americas, and definitely we we need to mention them just as we would the Olmec. Now, the largest and most powerful of all Mesoamerican civilizations was and were the Aztec, who arrived in the Valley of Mexico around 1200 A.D., right around the time that the book said that the Toltec came to an end. And uh, they are, of course, significant. It says, the Aztecs were a cultural blend of the Olmec, Zapotec, and Toltec civilizations. And like other civilizations, the Aztecs built great cities. Uh, Tenochtitlan, definitely their most significant. Uh, and this is built in 1325. And by the 1500s, it became a thriving urban center with a population of about 200,000 people. And we have to understand that when you have a population that large on one city, especially one like Tenochtitlan, that means you have basically reached the epitome of civilization. You have figured out how to bring fresh water into an area without it spoiling. You've learned to grow mass amounts of food. You definitely have a political structure in place in order to sustain that type of group of people. The Aztecs are oftentimes um, compared to the Romans, that the Aztecs were the Romans of the Americas, um, and uh, they are significant. In fact, after this, you're going to find that there is a video that I've placed up by the History Channel. It's called Engineering an Empire, the Aztecs. It's about a 45-minute long video. You need to watch that uh, in order to uh, do this week's um, work. Uh, and basically what you're going to find is that the Aztecs uh, had architectural majestic pieces of work. Uh, that really solved many of their problems. Uh, the fact that they, their city, and let me let me say this differently, their city attests to the sheer genius of the Aztec. That city, Tenochtitlan, was a floating city. It was an island. And they had to build all types of different things in order to make this city function. It was rather miraculous. It says, The city of Tenochtitlan was home to palaces, temples, markets, residential districts, aqueducts, all of which were connected by a complex set of streets laid out in a grid pattern, much like you would find in contemporary cities today. It says the Aztecs also established religious practices focused upon the worship of the sun god Huitlapochtli, who according to the Aztec legend made the sun rise each day, but only if he was nourished by human blood. And this is why the Aztecs uh, engaged in massive amounts of human sacrifice. Uh, they believed that the world would end if they did not sacrifice hundreds and hundreds of people to their gods every day. This also makes them very much war-bound people. In order to acquire the bodies requisite to engage in these types of practices, they needed to uh, engage in war upon other people in order to capture prisoners of war to then kill them. It's crab, cra kind of a crazy way of going about it, but that's the way that they did it. It says, the Aztecs developed into a great empire, largely based upon military might for the purposes of obtaining live prisoners for human sacrifice. And by the end of the 15th century, the Aztecs had reached the height of their power, and they did so under the reign of Montezuma II, who reigned in 1502. Montezuma II is the king of the Aztecs when Hernán Cortés arrives uh, and the Spanish conquer them. Now, I'm running through the Aztecs very, very, very quickly here. Uh, but again, the reason for that is because you have that video to watch, and I don't need to uh, say the same thing twice. Uh, but again, the Aztec are there, and I, I think that they're very, very significant, probably the more significant of the groups that we've talked about. And for this reason, I have you watch that video. It says, eventually the great Aztec Empire would fall to the Spanish conquistadors under the leadership of Hernán uh, or Hernando Cortés in 1521. Uh, now, uh, unlike the Maya, as far as I understand, there are no Aztecs remaining. The Spanish completely wiped them off the face of the planet, uh, much the same way Francisco Pizarro wiped out the Inca. There's just nothing left uh, of these groups of people. That said, uh, before you move on to the next section, go ahead and stop this. Watch that video on the Aztec put out by the History Channel uh, and, and get a better understanding of who these people were and what they accomplished. Uh, and then come back in and, and, and finish the, the, the PowerPoint. All right, so we've talked about the Mesoamericans, and of course the Aztec were by far the most significant, which now you should really grasp that after watching that film. 
Uh, but we also need to mention another very large uh, and important civilization. And for many historians, though I tend to disagree, many historians assume that the, the Inca who lived in South America were the most advanced uh, South American native group. It says, along the Andes Mountains, stretching from Ecuador to Chile, around 1200 AD, a new civilization emerged comprised of a group of people known as the Quechua. But the Quechua are now referred to as the Inca. And the reason why we called them the Inca and not the Quechua is because the first ruling family of this group of people were known as Inca. And so we now call them the Inca. It says it was connected by a system of roads and was governed by a form of government known as an autocracy. If you're not familiar with what an autocracy is, I have defined it here for you. This is a government in which one person has uncontrolled or unlimited authority over others. And so very similar to, to other types. It says the Inca Empire grew slowly, developing small kingdoms in an area known as the Valley of Cusco. Uh, if ever you've seen the Emperor's New Groove from the Disney, Walt Disney, you'll know that there is Emperor Cusco. Uh, and that is based upon Incan civilizations. Um, but... The Inca Empire does not become a massively significant empire until uh, the leader Pachacuti uh, came into power in 1438. As it says, under his leadership, the Inca Empire spread into modern-day Peru, settling in a land area of more than 2,500 miles, which is absolutely... it's a beast amount of land. Uh, and uh, this, again, attests just how advanced the, the Inca were. It says, this area was maintained through both militaristic campaigns and diplomacy. It says, as the empire expanded, so did the Inca culture and religion. The Inca, like the Aztecs, were polytheistic, but focused their attention greatly on worshipping the sun god, and they referred to him as Enti, or Inti, from whom they believed their kings were descendants. Uh, so the first Inca family believed that they were gods themselves. Again, going back to Egypt, uh, just like the pharaoh who viewed himself as not just the king of Egypt, but also a god, so did the Inca. It says they built shrines to their gods. The most sacred was the Temple of the Sun in Cusco, made almost entirely out of gold. Now, it's for this reason that the Spanish are going to come and wipe out the Inca. And the same is true for the Aztec, because the Aztec also had a number of... Uh, of riches and wealth that they possessed. Uh, and when the Spanish arrived, they see these wonderful buildings. They, they see all the amount of wealth that they possess. And, of course, the Spanish just take it and, and wipe them off the face of the planet. Uh, but, of course, in order to really dive deep into these groups of people, you'd have to take a class just on the Aztec or just on these Mesoamerican civilizations. Again, this is a history on the United States. And so we're only very briefly touching on these groups of people. Uh, this is that temple I was mentioning, Temple of the Sun. Now, I bring this picture up, uh, and if you know what it is, that's awesome. If you don't, that's okay. This is Machu Picchu. Machu Picchu is in Peru, and it is the only, as I understand it, the only remaining Inca civilization still around. Again, when the Spanish arrived, they destroyed not just the Inca, but but all their buildings. We have to remember that the Spanish came under the, the premise of Christianity and everything that the Inca, and again the Aztec as well, everything that they believed in was considered um, heathenistic and so it was completely wiped out. Well, the Spanish never found Machu Picchu. And so if you go into Peru, you can still go up the side of the mountain and, and take a look at this. And what's unique about Machu Picchu not, is not only that it's still there, but it was left virtually untouched. Um, and so you basically have an intact city, I mean, for the most part intact, um, the way it looked back when the Inca used it. Uh, and so that's, that's important. Again, you know, we've just covered a, a swath of information about a, a plethora of different civilizations and cultures, and there's still others to talk about. But again, I, I'm just, just skipping a stone over the top of everything, if you want to look at it that way, like skipping it over a, a, a bed of water. Uh, not going too deep into any of this, but just recognize, again, there are significant civilizations who lived, developed, and ultimately died uh, in the Americas long before Europeans ever got there. Uh, and it's just important to make that note. 
All right. We've looked briefly, again, at uh, Mesoamerica and South America. Let's now move up into what we now know as the United States and Canada and look at some North American civilizations. As it says, while the Mesoamerican and Southern American civilizations developed, so did certain native groups in North America. And you can see I've listed some of these dates here for you and some of the groups that thrived there. Uh, between 800 BC through 600 AD, you have the Adena and the Hopwell, and they thrived in the American Northeast. Between 600 AD and 1500 AD, you had the Mississippian in the Southeast. And in 400 BC, you had the Anazazi civilization, which was located in the Southwest. There's also North, uh, Northwest civilizations as, as well. So let's briefly take a look at this. It says, there were a number of different cultures living in the American Pacific Northwest, including the Quakawitil, the Nootka, and the Haida people. Uh, they would have lived geographically from what we would understand from Oregon to Alaska. That's kind of the area that they lived in. Uh, I'm not going to elaborate too much on these groups of people. My point at this, at this juncture is simply to indicate, look, these people were here. This is some of what they left behind. It says, those who lived in this region had access to many different natural resources and thus were able to boast large populations. Anytime that you see uh, a, a group of people who have large populations, it, it's due in part because they have figured out a way to maximize their natural resources. And those in the Pacific Northwest were able to do that, not to the same extent that you know the Aztec were able to do that. Um, but relatively speaking, it was large for the region that they were in. It says, above all else, the sea was the most important resource to these people who were able to kill whales in canoes large enough to hold about 15 people. It says, because of their environment, the tribes of the Pacific Northwest Coast developed complex societies. It says, within these societies, social classes were established. And again, this is important. Historians, archaeologists, anthropologists, and so forth and so on, we're always looking to see were there social classes, were there social distinctions. If there were social distinctions, you typically had a king, and then you had the lower peasantry, if you want to use that term. And these groups of people had them, uh, and they had various rituals that they would engage with where the rich would come out and display their wealth and give their wealth away. Uh, to those in need. So indicating, uh, again, that there is a social distinction within this class of people. All right. Again, like I said, I'm just very quickly covering this. Uh, next, we're looking at the, uh, the, the American Southwest. It says, unlike the Northwest, the land of the Southwest was much harsher, as if you live in Southern California, uh, you'll know that. Uh, but by 3000 BC, people began to farm. Uh, in the American Southwest. And of course, uh, if you live in California, you'll note that you can grow almost anything in California. Uh, the only climate that we don't have is tropical climates, although we can now generate tropical climates and grow things like bananas and pineapples. But you can grow almost anything in, ca in California. Yeah, the, the weather's hot. It, it can be harsh conditions. It's a desert, right? Um, you know, Arizona, Nevada, these are deserts. But you can grow a lot of things here. It says they also used pottery and there is clear evidence that their religious activities were influenced by those Mesoamericans. This is important because this indicates that there was a form of conversation going on between those in the Northwest and those in Mesoamerica. So there's some type of trade going on between these two groups of people. Uh, the extent of that trade is not really known, at least not known by me. Uh, but there is different cultural interactions going on, and, and that's significant. Okay. One of the most important American Southwest tribes was the Anazazi. Okay, the Anazazi. Uh, the Anazazi lived in an area uh, between the meeting point of Utah, Arizona, and Colorado. Now, I'm going to read to you a little bit about the Anazazi from my book. It says The Anazazi lived in baked mud adobe structures built four and five stories high. In contrast to the Mesoamerican cultures, Anazazi society lacked a rigid class structure. The religious leaders and warriors labored much as the rest of the people. In fact, they engaged in warfare only as a means of self-defense, and there is little evidence of human sacrifice or human trophies. Toward the end of the 13th century, a lengthy drought and the pressure of new arrivals from the north began to restrict the territory of the Anazazi. 
Into their peaceful world came the aggressive Navajo and Apache, followed two centuries later by the Spaniards. And ultimately, that's one of the reasons why the Anasazi are, are no longer in existence. But one of the things that the Anasazi did is they left behind a number of lasting legacies, and predominantly they left behind what we call massive cliff dwellings. And one of the most significant cliff dwellings is the Cliff Palace at Mesa Verde, located in Colorado. Okay, and I want you to be able to take a look at this. Now, this is a very small portion of what you're seeing, um, but they built this right into the cliff, which indicates a, a strong sense of understanding of engineering, a use of advanced tools, uh, and many of these groups of people did this by backbreaking labor. Uh, for example, we know that the Aztec did not have the wheels, so anytime that they had to move something, they did it by hand. Uh, and I would imagine, although I'm not 100% sure, but I would imagine that that's probably true for the Anazazi as well. But this is an example, uh, a very small snapshot of some of the things uh, that they left behind. Uh, and here you can see kind of an aerial view uh, of it, right into the cliff if you look to the top right uh, of the picture. All right, it says, in addition to the Northwest and Southwest tribes, other ancient peoples, largely mound builders, developed as early as 800 AD. Uh, and the groups of people that we're talking about here are the Adena and the Hopwell, and they were mound builders, which means that they built mounds. Okay, uh, And they left some of these mounds behind. For example, the uh, Great Serpent Mound in Ohio, uh, and see, uh, see that here. Uh, not totally sure what these were for or how they were used. Uh, again, one guess is for religious purposes. This is the last mound building culture was the Mississippian, which lasted from 800 to 1500 AD. Uh, going back to my book, it says, The Mississippian culture, centered in the central Mississippi River Valley, resembled the Mayan and Aztec societies in its intensive agricultural, substantial towns built around central plazas, temple mounds, and death cults which involved human torture and sacrifice. The Mississippian culture peaked in the 14th and 15th centuries and finally collapsed because of disease transmitted from Europeans. Uh, and they built a number of different things. It says uh, this group of individuals were led by priests, between 1,000 and 1,200 A.D., some 10,000 people lived at an area known as Cahokia, and uh, pretty intense. Now, with all that said, I say all that because it's important, again, to remember who was here, that there were people here. There were people here before Columbus arrived in 1492. In fact, there were Europeans in the New World before Columbus arrived in 1492. So when you were told that Columbus discovered the New World, that he discovered America, that's not really accurate. Okay? He discovered a, a land that was unknown to Europeans, and that's not even totally true either. And before I continue with Columbus, let's, let's examine why that's not true. Excuse me. It says, the earliest known contact between Europe and the Americas took place not in 1492, but in the mid to late 18, uh, 800s, uh, by 1000 AD, for example, we know that the Vikings had made their way from Scandinavia over to Greenland in North America. They were there. It says Norse expeditions, and again I'm reading in my book, Norse expeditions to the New World during the 10th and 11th centuries are the earliest that can be verified, and even they have dissolved into legend. Like Asians crossing the Bering Strait to the east, the Norsemen went island hopping across the North Atlantic to the west. Before about A.D. 870, they conquered Iceland from Irish settlers while other Vikings terrorized the coasts of Europe. Around A.D. 985, an Icelander named Eric the Red colonized the west coast of a rocky, four-bound island he deceptively called Greenland. Eric was the New World's first real estate booster, and about a year later, a trader missed Greenland and sighted land beyond. Knowing of this, Thervold Eriksson, son of Eric the Red, sailed out from Greenland about A.D. 1001 and sighted the coasts uh, of what we now refer to as Baffin Island. Okay? 
where he then settled for the winter. Now, these Vikings didn't stay very long, but they did arrive in the Americas. Okay, So there were a number of people, Europeans included, who came to the New World, what you know the Europeans eventually called the New World, long before Columbus ever did. Okay, Now, I, I think it's important to have brought all that up and um, talked about all that before we actually got to the Spanish coming, which ultimately led to the English coming. But, the, you know, the context needs to be there. Uh, or again, continuing with the Vikings, it says around 1000 AD, Eric the Red's son, Thorvald Eriksson, settled for a short time in an area he called Newfoundland. Historians have traditionally placed this area around Rhode Island or the Chesapeake Bay. The influence of the Norse upon American history is minute, for they left North America quickly, and by the 15th century, their Greenland colony had vanished. And so, again, just mentioning that, hey, they were there, just like the Maya, the Aztec, the Olmec, the Inca, the Anasazi, and everybody else. They were there. Now, let's talk about where some Americanists begin, and that's with Spanish America. Uh, and you really have to begin with Spain uh, because Christopher Columbus discovers supposedly this new world. If Columbus doesn't discover the Americas, well, then, of course, no Englishman is ever going to come over and Jamestown will never be settled. But it says European contact with the Americas did not fully get underway until the late 15th century and the arrival of Christopher Columbus in 1492. It says Christopher Columbus landed in the Caribbean on October 12, 1492, and his arrival marked a turning point in both Spanish and American history. Now, please remember uh, that he came over in three ships. In fact, Columbus had four voyages in total. Uh, his first voyage, he came with three ships, the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria. Uh, his second voyage, by the way, left with 17 ships and 1,000 settlers. So you begin to get an idea that uh, what he found in the New World, or what he was calling the New World, was uh, worth something, and he wanted people to settle the area. It says, Columbus discovered a wealth of gold in the Caribbean, and in 1493 he returned to Spain with a great deal of riches, and then in 1493 he leaves for his second voyage, and as I mentioned, he goes on a total of four. It says, in total, Columbus would return to the New World, as it would come to be called, with the goal of obtaining more wealth, and acquiring more land for the Spanish to colonize. And as I've already mentioned to you, he leaves in 1493. He leaves with a 1,000 settlers on 17 ships coming towards the New World in order to help create what was known as a transatlantic empire for the Spanish. For the Spanish. But as it would come out, of course, the English would show up and pretty much dominate the whole North American hemisphere, uh, at least for what we now know as the United States. Uh, this here is a map. I'll leave it here for a second. Uh, you can see uh, the routes that he took uh, to go on his different voyages. Uh, note where he does never go. He never goes on to the American or what we would call the United States mainland. He never sets foot on America proper. He's all around Cuba and Haiti and Hispaniola. Uh, and so even to say that he discovered America isn't exactly correct. He discovered a series of islands that surrounded or were near uh, America. And of course, what he was trying to do was to get to East India. Uh, that's why we refer to Native Americans as Indians, because he thought he was in India. He thought he could get to India by traveling west, which you can do, but there's a giant continent in the middle of it, and of course he wasn't aware that that was there. Okay. Uh, in fact, another example of how and why Columbus should not be credited with discovering America is because it's named America. Uh, it's not named Colombia. Um, uh, the reason why America is referred to as America is because of a, an Italian uh, who said, hey, the new world that we have discovered, that's not a part of Asia. That's not part of India. That's its own continent. And his name was Amerzio Vespucci. And uh, I believe there's a short film that I've embedded in here. I'll let you know where that is that you can watch. It's about a two-minute film uh, where you can get an, a better idea of who Emergio Vespucci is and why we're called America. It says, The land that Columbus had discovered was believed, prior to 1501, to be located in Asia. 
This would change, however, when in 1501 an Italian explorer named Armeggio Vespucci traveled to the eastern part of South America. He argued that this land was a new world, a world separate from Asia. And so here you can, you'll see that Asia is uh, colored differently. You can click on that now uh, and watch that. I encourage you to do so. It says, after colonizing the Caribbean, the Spanish looked toward the American mainland. Uh, and the picture you see here is a drawing, rather, of Hernando Cortez. And Hernando Cortez traveled in 1519 out of Cuba. And he traveled to where the, the Aztec eventually were. And, you know, uh, he came with a number of men known as conquistadors. And as uh, history would have it, uh, by 1521, uh, Hernando Cortez had destroyed uh, the Aztec civilization in search of gold and uh, for that he not only acquired gold but he acquired the entire valley of Mexico and that area became part of a Spanish empire now Cortez and others as we will briefly mention here uh, they started a process of colonization in the New World which would eventually cause the Spanish to move further north into modern-day Arizona and California in search of gold. When they didn't find any, they abandoned it and uh, left it to the priests, which is why in California you have a number of missions and a strong uh, Spanish Catholic you know, cultural historical heritage here. But it all begins here with Hernan Cortes. Now, as I mentioned, he eventually destroys the, the Aztec. Uh, we've, we've already mentioned that, so let, let's just move on. In addition to Cortes, you also have... Uh, a man by the name of Pizarro, and uh, Pizarro does the same thing to the Inca that Cortes did to the Aztec. Uh, he destroys them, and again, uh, you, you can sort of read the, the information here, uh, but the idea here is, again, he's looking for gold. When he finds it, he kills the king, Atahualupa, and uh, again, like Cortes, helps to begin this Spanish empire, which will eventually move further north. Uh, now, obviously, once the Spanish in, uh, arrive in North America, this you know kind of causes a number of other Europeans, including the English, to begin their own process of colonization. Uh, and so that's really why I talk about all this. It's to lay that framework, that context to who was here, why did they show up, and how did that affect the English, which eventually led to the original 13 colonies and then the establishment of the United States. All right, now... Now that we've talked about everything that is non-English and non-United States, let's now uh, begin the process of looking at uh, the English colonization of the Americas and the beginning of essentially what would become the United States of America. It says, the story of English colonization begins in 1578 when a man named Sir Humphrey Gilbert received a royal patent to claim lands in Americas for Queen Elizabeth. Queen Elizabeth is a very significant woman. Uh, you may have never heard of her, uh, although I'm sure you've heard of the state named after her, and that was uh, Virginia, so named because Queen Elizabeth I was referred to as the Virgin Queen. She ruled from 1558 in England until 1603. Uh, now, after 1603, a gentleman by the name of King James uh, becomes the king, and that's where we get the name Jamestown from, and we'll talk more more about that later. But the very first colony, the very first attempted colony, uh, was put forth by the English, and it wasn't Jamestown. Jamestown was the first successful colony, but the first colony that the English attempted to colonize was one known as Roanoke, and it was done so by this gentleman by the name of Gilbert. It says, Gilbert unsuccessfully attempted to embark to the New World two times, and it would not be until 1583 that he would leave England and sail near uh, Nargisant Bay, which is located in Rhode Island. It says, by 1584, Sir Walter Riley, half-brother to Gilbert, persuaded Queen Elizabeth to renew uh, a charter in his own name. The previous attempt under Gilbert was unsuccessful. It didn't succeed, so he had to return back to England. And so in 1584, Walter Riley uh, decides that he is going to uh, renew the charter under Elizabeth's uh, approval and come back and establish another colony. 
Uh, and it says, and in 1587, he set sail to the Americas with 100 colonists and settled the area known as Roanoke Island, which was located in North Carolina. Now, when they got there, they established uh, a governor. His name was John White. Well, after a month of living at Roanoke Island, uh, John White had to return back to England in order to acquire supplies because they were running low. It's about a three to four month journey from the Americas to England, so it was going to take him about half a year, a little bit longer. But unfortunately, when John White returned to England, the Spanish Armada uh, had started between Spain and England, and if you're not familiar with that, eventually the English are successful against the Spanish and they destroy their armada. But John White is a skilled salesman. Uh, and I don't mean as far as selling a product, he can sail a ship. And she refused to let him return to Roanoke Island with supplies because she wanted his ship and she wanted his skill. Now, the Spanish Armada lasted for three years, uh, and ultimately, when England was successful, White returned to Roanoke Island. Okay, But when White finally returned in 1590, he discovered that the colony had vanished no traces of settlement could be found. Let's go back to my text. It says, While some may have gone south, the main body of colonists appears to have gone north to the southern shore of the Chesapeake, as they had talked of doing, and lived there for some years until killed by the local Indians. Unless some remnant of the Roanoke settlement did survive in the woods, there was still not a single English colonist in North America when Queen Elizabeth died in 1603. No one knows where these people went. And it's interesting to talk about this because this is the very first attempt by the English to establish a colony. It didn't succeed. It wasn't permanent. Okay? Now, all of this has been said. And I do that because it lays the context for what we're about to deal with next week. And that is, of course, Jamestown and the first of the original 13 colonies. But I think it's important to have this this background story to understand that there were people here, that there were civilizations here, that the Spanish were here, that the English were here all before 1607 when Jamestown was finally established. Now, uh, hopefully that was helpful to you, and if you have any questions, feel free to contact me. Uh, I can uh, expand upon any of this that you may like. All right, have a great one, guys.